Hi, welcome to APP to APP virtual lectures. I'm Alicia Duvajank. I'm a nurse practitioner, headache specialist, and a headache program director at Genesis Headache Clinic in Davenport, Iowa. I'm excited today to share with you uh, some thoughts and education regarding identification of secondary headaches. So primary versus secondary headache. This is an important issue because headache is really a universal experience um, to human beings. It's a really common symptom in a variety of disease states and up to 18% of patients that are presenting to a tertiary care centers have an underlying secondary cause of their headache that's important to uh, determine. Primary headache patients can also develop secondary headaches. So just because your patient has an underlying headache disorder doesn't mean we don't need to look for these red flags that indicate secondary headaches. In addition, there's a lot of features of secondary headaches that are very similar to primary headache disorders. So you really can't uh, necessarily rule out a secondary headache disorder uh, just with a certain diagnostic criteria because somebody meets diagnostic criteria for a primary headache disorder. So we have a mnemonic in headache medicine called SNOOP4. Um, th this has actually been uh, de uh, further developed over the last several years. I think there's people who have, we, I think we've got SNOOP5. I think there's even more, but I'm really just going to stick with the SNOOP4 um, because I think it's just a, a little easier to remember, a little more straightforward for those of you who are not headache providers. So our SNOOP4 starts with systemic symptoms or disease, neurologic signs or symptoms, onset, older age, positional component, prior history of headaches, pregnancy, progressive features of headache, and headaches that are precipitated by Valsalva. So we'll start with systemic symptoms or disease. This one is fairly straightforward. Your patient presents with headache and it's associated with fever, chills, night sweats, weight loss, jaw claudication, where they're getting um, weakness in the jaw as they chew or talk, uh, history of malignancy, immunosuppression, like an HIV patient or perhaps a patient on immunom immunomodulating or immunosuppressant medications, or patients with history of chronic infections. We just need to be mindful that these people could present with headache, uh, secondary headaches. And in that differential diagnosis for these patients would be metastasis, giant cell arteritis, or infection, whether that's systemic infection or a central nervous system infection. Neurologic signs and symptoms that can be seen uh, that need to throw up some red flags for us as providers would be confusion, focal neurological signs, someone has unilateral weakness, facial droop, uh, pupillary abnormalities, these kinds of things. Uh, double vision or diplopia should uh, be evaluated if that's something that your patient is presenting with. Transient visual obscurations, those can be monocular or binocular um, uh, and pulsatile tinnitus. In these situations, we wanna make sure we're ruling out things like mass lesions, structural or vascular lesions, stroke or hydrocephalus. The first O in SNOOP4 is for onset. Really what we're talking about here are thunderclap headaches. So a thunderclap headache is a headache that comes on very suddenly and escalates from zero to 10 within 60 seconds. Uh, you need to inquire about activities at the onset of this headache. Were they straining? Were they involved in some kind of physical exertion? Uh, were they involved in some sexual activity? Uh, these are important features to note. Here, it, our differential diagnosis, if somebody presents to you with this type of headache, uh, we want to think about reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome or RCVS, subarachnoid hemorrhage, venous sinus thrombosis, uh, arterial dissection, pituitary apoplexy or ischemia, or idiopathic intracranial hypertension. So, so if someone presents in an ED type uh, environment with a thunderclap headache, there are some things that we need to do. We wanna make sure we get a CT without contrast. This is what's going to help 
rule out subarachnoid hemorrhage. This is most sensitive within six hours of onset of the symptoms. So um, hopefully your patient has sought care within that amount of time. If your CT is negative and not showing uh, any, any signs of SAH, then you need to get a lumbar puncture. You want to obtain opening pressure, cell count, protein, glucose, closing pressure, and you want to do a visual inspection uh, for xanthochromia, which is usually a yellow or orangish uh, discoloration that's indicating um, that's indicating uh, blood products in in the the sample. This is most sensitive anywhere from 12 hours to two weeks after onset. Uh, so if um, let's say your patient uh, delayed care, uh, they decided, oh, I'm gonna go talk to my patient in an outpatient setting next week instead of presenting to the ER, uh, the LP is still going to be helpful. If your CT and your LP are non-diagnostic, you're not finding any problems, it is important to proceed with MRI of the brain this needs to be with and without contrast. You also want to do uh, either a CTA or MRA of the head and neck, uh, and with that, an MRV, and that's essentially um, similar to an MRA, but instead of looking at the arterial system, it's looking at the venous system of the head. So differential diagnosis, uh, your subarachnoid hemorrhage or RCVS that I mentioned at the beginning, those statistically are your two most common reasons that people are going to experience thunderclap headaches. Uh, other things that can happen, you can have this type of presentation with arterial dissection, whether that's vertebral, carotid, or intracranial. You can have uh, these symptoms in cerebral venous sinus or cortical vein thrombosis. That's where the MRV comes in because you want to identify those, uh, those problems. Non-vascular issues that can happen include spontaneous intracranial hypotension, uh, pituitary apoplexy or ischemia, the colloid cyst of the third ventricle, or sometimes acute hypertensive crisis. So we're going to talk about a couple uh, of, of important things to remember about uh, RCVS. So RCVS is usually presenting as a recurrent thunderclap headache. This can involve two to 10 episodes over one to two weeks. That's kind of the classic. Um, so if uh, your patient has recurrence of thunderclap headache over time, RCVS is statistically your most likely problem. Risk factors for RCVS include female gender, 40 to 50 years old, Caucasian, uh, postpartum status, marijuana or serotonergic medication use, stimulant or cold medication use, binge drinking, and migraine patients, of course, are at higher risk of this. Um, history of depression, uh, hypertension, exposure to glucocorticoids could also uh, contribute. This presentation is often provoked by activities such as urinating, bathing or showering, bending, valsalva, sexual activity, or even strong emotions. And it can be associated with a mild to moderate continuous headache, altered level of consciousness, seizure, neurologic deficits, migranous features, ischemic or hemorrhagic stroke. So it is important to identify because it, it, they, you can have some complications. Now, uh, your diagnostic testing, if you're looking at that, your brain CT and your MRI of the brain should be normal in most patients if there's no associated complications. Your, your lumbar puncture and the CSF uh, contents should be normal or near normal as well. When you do your angiography, so you do an MRA and that will, will often reveal what we call a multifocal vasoconstriction. This looks like a string of beads type appearance. It literally looks like a string of beads. And that is best seen two to three weeks after symptom onset. If you do uh, diagnose RCVS, uh, maybe on angiography, or uh, you're highly suspicious of the clinical presentation, verapamil is the gold standard for treatment of RCVS. Moving on to older age, these would be patients over 50 years old. These are patients who have new onset headache or a persistent or progressive headache. 
So a, a, a primary headache disorder does not present in patients in over 50 years old. If a patient has a primary headache disorder, whether that's tension type headache, cluster headache, migraine, other TACs, uh, things like that, those should be presenting or uh, starting before the patient is 50. You do need to take a careful history um, because sometimes patients don't necessarily offer up history, their history of primary headaches, especially if their primary headaches were years ago and they haven't had any recently. But if your patient truly has a new onset headache or it becomes persistent or progressive and they are over 50 years old, we need to think about certain things mass lesions, subdural hematomas, giant cellar temporal arteritis, or cervicogenic headaches are very common in this population as well. Brain tumors. So this is one of the things that people get most concerned about. When I say people, I'm, think, I'm talking about patients. They all come and they say, I think I have a brain tumor because this headache just won't go away. Um, so just wanna discuss that a little bit. Brain tumors can be benign or malignant. They can be primary or metastatic. And we talk about a classic triad for brain tumor headaches. This involves severe pain, uh, pain that's present uh, early in the morning and awakening the patient out of sleep and nausea. But only about 17% of patients with brain tumors actually present with what we consider the classic triad. Uh, the phenotype of brain tumor headaches are often consistent with tension type headaches. So it is a difficult, uh, a difficult uh, thing to rule out clinically. We really uh, need that uh, imaging to, to rule that out. Subdural hematoma. This can often happen in our uh, older population because we have, we all go through some degree of cerebral atrophy as we age. And this decreases the support for the bridging veins uh, in the cranium. So because of this, even minor falls or seemingly inconsequential head injuries can result in, um, in, in subdural hematoma. And these symptoms might present long after the trauma is sustained. They may be fine that day or the next day, but maybe the next week they start to um, have fluctuating level of consciousness, maybe they're starting to become confused have, or have gait disturbances. Um, so definitely need to look out for delayed symptoms in, uh, in our older patients that present with falls or head injury. Giant cell arteritis. This is a really uh, big thing that we need to be on the lookout for for a, our new onset headache in patients over 50. Headache is the most common symptom of this disorder. 70 to 90% of patients experience headache with this, often associated with jaw claudication, temporal tenderness or nodularity, decreased or absent temporal pulsations, generalized fatigue or myalgias and arthralgias. These people look ill. These, these people present, they're not healthy looking patients. So you have someone who is a, a little toxic looking, they look sick um, and they are of older age and have any of these uh, features, definitely need to think about giant cell or temporal arteritis. So when you are suspicious of this condition, a couple of things you need to do. You need to get an ESR. I also usually grab a CRP. Um, and a, a, a hepatic panel. Your ESR is often is is uh, greater than fifty in eighty nine percent of patients with giant cell arteritis, and is over a hundred in forty one percent. So that's a little more sensitive than the CRP, but I usually will grab a CRP anyway. Um, it's not uncommon to have mild liver function abnormalities or mild anemia. False negatives, it is important to remember, can be seen in patients taking NSAIDs or steroids. So just be aware of that. You also want to obtain a temporal artery biopsy. So you're gonna send your patients to a vascular surgeon. You do want to perform the, uh, you want to have the biopsy performed within 48 hours of initiating steroid treatment if possible, because as I said, um, steroids can kind of uh, change the picture. Often the surgeons will do a multiple section analysis uh, because this can improve yield of the diagnostic testing because the disease can be kind of patchy. So you're gonna get a better answer if you are, are looking at multiple sections. 
If you're suspicious of giant cell arteritis, you do want to initiate treatment while you're awaiting the biopsy results. You do not want to sit and wait for the biopsy results because this condition can, uh, can cause permanent visual loss and sometimes other issues. So you definitely do not want to delay treatment. What I do is I put the patient on a prednisone 60 to 80 milligrams daily for treatment. And I refer them off to our friends in rheumatology uh, for ongoing evaluation and treatment. Cervicogenic headaches, very common as, uh, as patients age and enter uh, the latter years of their life. Often this presents as occipital or suboccipital pain. Sometimes you can even reproduce or increase it with suboccipital pressure. So these people who come in and say, I can push right here and elicit my headache. That is suspicious for cervicogenic. Phenotype is often consi consistent with tension type headache, but not always. Often these headaches are unilateral. Sometimes patients can present with dizziness, um, cervical tenderness and muscle spasms might limit motion. So you uh, may end up with maybe a cervical dystonia type presentation. And interestingly, cervical imaging is often similar to age matched controls. So you, it, just because someone looks like they have a pretty good looking neck on imaging doesn't mean they're not having cervicogenic headache. Conversely, just because someone has a really bad looking neck, they've got bulging discs or bone spurs, um, degenerative disc disease, that doesn't necessarily uh, guarantee that their headache is cervicogenic. So you do need to uh, uh, be careful about um, uh, making too many conclusions based on imaging alone. So our first P in our SNOOP4 mnemonic is positional. So these are headaches that worsen with change in position. So this can be an orthostatic headache, which comes on or worsens significantly with sitting or standing, or, re or recumbent headaches, which means they worsen or come on when patients lie flat in the supine position. Different differential diagnoses for this are CSF leaks, elevated intracranial pressure, mass lesions, cerebrovenous sinus thrombosis, or cervical pathology. So CSF leaks. Uh, this uh, traditionally is called intracranial hypotension. Um, and we, I, we can divide these into two general groups, traumatic CSF leaks and spontaneous CSF leaks. So a traumatic CSF leak can be surgical or procedural, um, patients with shunts, cranial or spinal surgeries, patients who have had lumbar punctures. Those post-LP headaches uh, are the most common presentation and most easily identifiable uh, presentation of CSF leaks. So I, I think we're, most of us are fairly familiar. Patient has a lumbar puncture or maybe they have a spinal anesthesia for a surgery. And then uh, subsequently they have a headache that gets worse when they stand and that keeps them from, um, from being upright. Uh, that is usually easy to identify because they just had a procedure, right? Usually uh, in, in, in just the few days before the, the start of the headache. A um, little less, common, a little harder to identify are bony abnormalities. Uh, you can see patients with bone spurs um, or uh, other bony abnormalities uh, that can uh, result in CSF leaks, especially if there's some kind of um, uh, a trauma. Sometimes it's uh, something as seemingly benign as, um, oh, I tripped and fell, up, fell uh, and then all of a sudden they have these issues uh, and it was because there was an underlying bony abnormality. Spontaneous CSF leaks are a little more rare, but they do happen. These often occur in patients with connective tissue disease. These can include dural tears, meningeal diverticulum, or worst case uh, scenario or most severe presentation would be CSF venous fistulas. So um, 
CSF leaks, this is usually an orthostatic headache is occurring when patient is upright and it's relieved with recumbency. But the time to relief is variable. It's often within one hour, but not always. These headaches don't usually wake people up from sleep because they're lying flat when they sleep, so they're not aggravating the condition. Um, the location, quality, and severity of the headache is variable, uh, so that's uh, not a helpful, uh, that's not helpful, but these patients often report being worse in their upright and worse as their day progresses with ongoing upright activity. One of the most difficult features about CSF leak headaches is that as people go on with this headache, over time, the orthostatic features decrease. So as they go months or maybe even years with this headache type, they lose that positional component. So that makes it a little difficult. So I'm often talking to people about, well, tell me what this headache was like when it first started. When it first started, was it different? Did there, was there a positional component? Um, and then did you lose that? So I often delve very deeply into the history. Other common symptoms can be spinal pain, uh, cochlear vestibular symptoms like hearing changes or vertigo, cranial nerve palsies, orthostatic nausea, cognitive or personality changes, gait disturbance, paresthesias, or even dementia or Parkinsonian presentations. These headaches are often worse with Valsalva, sex, lifting, cough, or exercise, and are improved with things like increased hydration, caffeine, and NSAIDs. We often, if I am suspicious of a CSF leak, I will often put the patient through what we call a 48-hour flat test. It's actually exactly what it sounds like. You have your patient in bed, flat, um, they can have a pillow, they can turn side to side, but basically as flat as they can. And they're gonna do that for 48 hours, just getting up for bathroom breaks or maybe slight elevation to eat or drink. Um, generally, if someone has a, a CSF leak, by the end of that 48 hour flat test, their symptoms will be significantly improved. Um, so that can be a very helpful test to really tease out is there a positional component to this headache? Of course, there are some um, kind of practical limitations with, with the testing. Some patients just cannot take 48 hours out of their life to do that. Um, other patients have such positional symptoms that they say, hey, I've already done this 48 hour flat test. I can't get up right. So um, you'll wanna talk to your patients about uh, the viability of, of doing this test. Often CSF leak headaches are better with higher altitudes or with, uh, with airplane travel. So that's an interesting uh, uh, feature. The diagnosis of CSF leaks. This is a really tough issue. Classically, the diagnostic criteria include low CSF pressure on a lumbar puncture, less than 60 millimeters of water, or radiographic evidence of CSF leak. But more recent research has found that the assessment of the CSF pressure with a lumbar puncture is of questionable diagnostic value, so it is not uh, routinely recommended at this point. Uh, CSF leak and MRI, um, there are things that we look for in brain MRIs, like venous sinus engorgement, pachymeningeal enhancement, subdural fluid collections, or brain sag, or crowding. Um, these are specific measurements that you're seeing here uh, that can be done to assess for brain sag or crowding in that posterior fossa. Um, essentially, your CSF fluid um, creates a buoyancy of the brain, right? That's part of the protection of the brain. So your brain is kind of floating in your CSF fluid, and that um, provides protection when you're um, moving around, or maybe I am stopped suddenly and have a little um, not whiplash injury, but just maybe something a little less substantial, um, it, that, that fluid protects my brain, right? If you have a CSF leak you uh, and that fluid is leaking out, you lose some of that buoyancy. And so that's where you get that kind of brain sag. Um, 
just at the top, I just have a little extra information in here. Um, with your exam, sometimes patients are reporting uh, or you're noting on your exam hearing changes. They might have severe photophobia or balance issues, um, coat hanger type pain um, in, in the neck, down the shoulders, uh, visual changes if there's six, six cranial nerve involvement, altered taste or smell, and even cognitive delays. Um, again, comorbidities that uh, are often seen with CSF leaks often include connective tissue disease, hypermobility, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, uh, pineal cysts sometimes can be associated. Um, rarely we see uh, skull-based leaks. These are usually leaks in the spine. Um, really the skull-based leaks, um, I'm only going to be suspicious of those if I, if I am having, um, if I really had a direct um, facial or head trauma that, uh, especially uh, facial trauma that resulted in lots of fractures, things like that, then I might um, think about a skull-based leak. Otherwise, I'm usually looking at um, a, a spinal leak. Polycystic kidney disease, history of retinal attachments, a detachment, POTS, Chiari malformations, mast cell activation. These are all issues that patients with connective disease disease, connective tissue disease often deal with. Um, so if your patient has, if you're suspicious for a CSF leak and they have any of this kind of history, you may need to want to uh, look into the possibility of a connective tissue disease. So spinal imaging, that's really important. If you're not finding um, your answer, a, a very clear answer in your MRI of the brain, as far as CSF leak, you do want to move on to spinal imaging. Uh, the, uh, it is interesting and important, I think, to know that when you look at imaging, whether you're talking about brain imaging or spinal imaging, it is not unusual to have normal imaging a lot of the time, especially with the brain MRIs. Um, so just a normal MRI of the brain will not rule out a CSF leak. Now, if you see some of those features on the previous slide, that definitely will, will, will help to rule in a CSF leak, but absence does not mean it's not there. So then we're gonna move on to spinal imaging. So we can do non-invasive spinal um, uh, MRIs, but they're of limited clinical utility. But if you happen to have one, uh, you can look for things like epidural fluid collections, venous distension, or collapse dura. MR or CT myelography really is the gold standard, and that's going to be much uh, more diagnostically helpful. Uh, we often like to go with the MR myelography because it is not as invasive as the CT myelography. Um, there is also, and I didn't put it on here, there is something called a radioisotope cisternography or RIC. Those can be done and involve uh, in a needle into the, into the lumbar area um, and injection of a radioisotope into the CSF space. And uh, if there is a CSF leak, you often can see the extravasion of the radio, uh, radioisotope into other areas um, outside of the spinal canal, sometimes uptake into uh, the kidneys. That's a little more invasive. So again, I do try to stay away from that as much as I can. And I usually will get a, a good enough answer with my, with my MR myelography. So what do you do if you think your patient has a CSF leak? First of all, conservative treatment. This is actually really helpful for people who have um, a new onset CSF leak of, of a very obvious cause. I'm talking about like your post LP CSF leaks, right? A lot of times people will actually resolve spontaneously. The, the patient's own body will kind of heal that um, tear and uh, they won't need any additional treatment. The things that you can do to help facilitate that is bed rest, increased fluids, increased caffeine, theophylline is sometimes used to increase the uh, CSF pressure, steroids can be used as well, and sometimes abdominal binders. So if I'm using an abdominal binder and I'm increasing thoracic pressure, I'm going to increase the pressure into the spinal canal and that can help with symptoms. Now, if conservative treatment does not work, uh, or if this has been a long-standing issue, um, 
Often we need to escalate treatment. The, the most common is blood patching. This can be empirical or targeted. So I, I kind of explain this to patients. Uh, I use the example of fix a flat, probably because my, my husband's an auto mechanic and, and uh, did much, had much of his career in a tire shop. So, um, you know, you have, a, you get a nail in your tire and there's a leak, right? So the pressure is down. Um, you take it, to, you take it to the shop, you um, have them uh, apparently, excuse me for, for my non-educated um, auto skills, but they put the fix a flat up into the tire. It goes and finds the leaks and seals them. So blood patching is similar, only we're taking the blood uh, out of the patient's arm and we're injecting it into the spinal canal, uh, usually uh, often in the lumbar area. If it's Empirical might be higher up if it's more of a targeted blood patch. So empirical means I don't know where the leak is, but I'm going to do this blood patch and, and, and see if um, th that can uh, resolve the leak. Um, if that doesn't work, I often start with, with empirical blood patching. I'll do uh, maybe two to three empirical blood patches, um, and that is often enough to uh, resolve the issue. A lot of times people do need a more than one patch for full resolution. But if that's not working, we've done a couple blood patches, it's not working. And if I can, um, and if I can find the site of the leak, then they can do a targeted blood patch in that specific level. Blood patches can be single level, bi-level, multi-level, depends on uh, where the leak is and how many they have. People with connective tissue disease specifically can have multiple leaks in, in multiple areas. Uh, sometimes in certain facilities, they can use fibrin blue if uh, the blood patching doesn't work. Um, often these targeted blood patches and use of fibrin blue are done more at tertiary centers. Uh, in my area, we don't do these. We do more empirical blood patching uh, just because of limitations in the services in our area. Um, so I will send if, if one of these um, other treatments are needed or if they require surgical repair because it's a complex case, they have a CSF a venous fistula or uh, patients have failed all other treatments, I'm sending them to tertiary centers to get this taken care of someplace with a CSF leak program. So looking at the other side of the spectrum, we've got intracranial hypertension. So this is most often a disorder of females in childbearing years um, with a nine to one female to male ratio. Doesn't mean it doesn't happen in male patients, but it's certainly much more common in females. Obesity is a significant risk factor, but your patient does not need to be obese to have intracranial hypertension. And on the opposite side, just because your patient is obese doesn't mean that their headache is caused by intracranial hypertension. It is much more complicated than that. Uh, headache is your most common symptom. 75 to 99% of patients uh, present with headache, although I do have some intracranial hypertension patients without headache. So you do need to be mindful of those, especially if they're being sent to you by ophthalmology because of apple edema. Uh, these headaches are often worse with recumbency. So your patient cannot lay flat, cannot sleep flat because the pain gets worse, or the patient is being awakened from sleep with this pain. Um, and that's because the pressure is increasing as they're laying supine. Um, the other feature that is very common in intracranial hypertension are transient visual obscurations or TVOs. These can be monocular or binocular. Um, and so these, um, they'll just lose piece, pieces of, of their vision and it will kind of come and go. This is because of a temporary disruption in the microcirculation of the optic nerve head. This is one of the reasons it is so, so important to identify intracranial hypertension and address it. Because if you don't, you can end up with permanent damage of the optic nerve and people are going to lose vision. Differential diagnosis for elevated ICP. Um, you're looking at idiopathic intracranial hypertension most commonly um, if your patient is otherwise presenting as a healthy appearing uh, person. We can also see mass lesions, CSF infection, CNS infections, hydrocephalus, ruptured aneurysms, 
or venous sinus thrombosis or stenosis as a cause of elevated ICP. So what do you do if you're suspecting intracranial hypertension? You want to get the MRI of the brain with and without contrast. You want to do a dilated fundus exam. I'm usually sending my patients to ophthalmology or neuro-ophthalmology for that. You also want to uh, obtain a lumbar puncture with opening pressure. If your patient has tonsillar descent, that will be contraindicated. So what will you see in your MRI? There's a few things that can give you clues that uh, intracranial hypertension might be a problem. Seeing an empty cella or partially empty cella, this would be concave. Um, you may not see or barely see um, the pituitary tissue that is, uh, that, that's because of uh, the pituitary is being compressed. Um, you can see flattening of the optic globe. Usually the optic globe is nice and circular. Uh, in intracranial hypertension, uh, you just see kind of a flattened appearance on the side of the optic nerve, that, um, that posterior side of, of the optic globe. You can see tetracity of the optic nerve sheath. So usually it's nice and straight. If you see um, kind of uh, uh, wavy or torturous uh, presentation of, of the nerve sheath, that is suspicious. You can sometimes see thickening of the optic head, um, which I kind of describe, it just, it kind of looks like um, if you have your optic globes, it kind of just looks like a little nippling. Um, and it, that's, um, that just, is indicative of a thickening of that optic nerve head uh, or focal stenosis of the transverse sinus can also be seen. Lumbar puncture. So make sure that you always order an opening pressure and CSF analysis for cell count protein and glucose when you're suspicious for inter, uh, intracranial hypertension. Your CSF analysis should show normal contents. If it does not, it might indicate some other issue. When you get opening pressure, you're, you're going to get your best results if it's performed in the lateral decubitus position. And it's very difficult to do under fluoroscopy. So in those circumstances where radiology is performing these under fluoroscopy, the results are not as accurate. Um, that can be a difficult issue um, I, in my own ex, uh, health system. Uh, we generally do not do lumbar punctures, not under fluoroscopy. So when you don't have optimal positioning, we want to take that into account when we're interpreting our pressure. So over greater than or equal to 25 centimeters of water is indicative of, of elevated ICP. If you don't have optimal positioning, that might be underestimated. So if uh, because I know that my patients don't always have optimal positioning or often don't have optimal positioning with their lumbar punctures. I often, um, if the patient, um, if their clinical presentation is very suspicious for intracranial hypertension, um, maybe their MRI of the brain is suspicious for intracranial hypertension or they have papilledema, I'm probably uh, going to um, lower my expectations. I might uh, be really suspicious in those patients if their pressure is over 20. So if you have diagnosed intracranial hypertension um, and you have deemed it to be idiopathic, we did not find anything uh, like a clot or a tumor or anything like that that was contributing to the intracranial hypertension. Uh, we want to know how to manage it. So weight loss is a gold standard, as little as 6% weight loss. This does not mean your morbidly obese patient has to get into a normal BMI. Even a 6% weight decrease can significantly improve intracranial hypertension. So we're always talking to patients like that uh, about that. I'm often sending, um, if sending them to medical bariatrics or sometimes even surgical bariatrics, depending on the situation and um, what they're wanting. If there is uh, papilledema and concern in, in that respect, we want to use uh, medications, usually carbonic and hydrase inhibitors or diuretics. Acetazolamide is usually the gold standard, um, but that one sometimes has some toleration issues uh, or contraindications. If your patient cannot be on acetazolamide, often furosemide is used. 
Uh, topiramate can also, uh, it, it's, it's related to acetazolamide, also good for, uh, for headache control in general. So we often use that medication. Of course, you need to be mindful of uh, history of kidney stones. You need to make sure your female patients are on um, uh, really good um, uh, birth control. Uh, and oral birth control is not usually what we're looking for. It's not necessarily as reliable. And these medications can sometimes interfere with effectiveness of those birth control pills. Um, optic nerve fenestration is sometimes done. That helps to preserve vision. It helps to keep that pressure um, from transferring onto that optic nerve. So it doesn't bring down your pressure, but it helps to save the vision. Stenting can be done in intracranial hypertension, but it's very controversial. Um, so you might have patients that have had it. You um, might have patients who think that's gonna be their answer and you send them uh, for treatment and, they, and, and some, uh, the, the surgeon says, nope, that's not appropriate. That's why it's just a very uh, controversial uh, treatment for a few different reasons. So the next P is prior history. So this is a new onset headache or a change to a persistent or daily headache um, or even a progressive headache. Um, so if, if uh, a progressive headache, meaning it's just getting worse and worse and worse and worse. So if you have this kind of headache, um, you're looking at um, trying to rule out mass lesions, infections, vascular lesions, or abnormal CSF pressure issues. Um, so these are the patients, you know, maybe they have migraine, maybe they have tension type headache, some other primary headache disorder, but this is different. So your patient says, I know I have migraine. Maybe they even have chronic migraine. Um, but this is not my migraine. This is different than my migraine. Um, I'm not, we're not usually looking at frequency or severity unless um, changes, unless you're talking about that progressive headache um, or persistent daily headache that was not persistent or daily before. Otherwise, um, often we're looking at different features, right? It's in a different place. It has different characteristics. It has different associated symptoms, these kinds of things. Uh, pregnancy, you always want to be mindful of a new onset headache during pregnancy or new onset headache in the postpartum period. Pregnant women can uh, are at risk for different issues. They are at higher risk for cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, RCVS, pituitary lesions, strokes. They also can present with preeclampsia that can uh, have headache as an associated feature or CSF leaks, especially in the postpartum period. P patients who have had um, spinal anesthesia or epidurals, or patients who have had very prolonged or difficult labors that have had to push for long periods of time and could have had some uh, trauma in that way. Patients who present with headaches precipitated by Valsalva. So uh, these patients who um, have onset of or worsening of headache when they cough, when they sneeze, when they bend over, when they strain, or when they're involved in sexual activity or orgasm. You want to think about intracranial or posterior fossa mass, Chiari malformations, um, intracranial pressure changes. Other secondary headaches that are important to know about, um, post-traumatic headaches, Medication overuse headache, which is one of uh, the most common uh, things that I see in, in my headache center. I, I always tell people medication overuse keeps me in business. Uh, you don't want your patient using any medication, um, that, any pain medication, any migraine medication, with the exception of G-pants, uh, more than two to three times a week or 10 to 15 days per month, depending on what medication they're using or they could be overusing medication, which leads to increased headache. There are people out there with cervicogenic headache. We did talk about that a little bit uh, when I talked about our patients of older age, but certainly cervicogenic headaches can happen in our younger population as well. And I also put, I, I like to put in here our patients with temporomandibular dysfunction. I think these, this is one of the most overlooked problems in headache patients. I often find that there's a very large uh, component of TMD contributing to various headache conditions. And it's so common that the TMD is not recognized 
or if it is recognized, it's not addressed. So that is a really important thing to address. We want to think about, um, you know, physical therapy with a, a TMD specialist. We want to think about um, oral appliances. We want to think about other, uh, perhaps other uh, ways that we can control or um, um, manage TMD. And that will really increase uh, the likelihood that you're going to get your patient's headaches under control. Just a few little pearls here at the end, um, single versus recurrent episodes. A single episode of headache should always raise concern for a secondary cause. Now patients get concerned um, often with the opposite. I get, I get patients who come in and say, this headache just doesn't, I just keep getting these headaches. They're so, so frequent. I'm getting them five days a week and they're so, so frequent. And they feel like that means there's something very wrong. But in reality, recurrent headache is a little more reassuring than a single episode of headache. Not that we don't need to look into it. We still need to look at our SNOOP 4, SNOOP 5, whatever SNOOP you're using um, and rule out other secondary causes. But a single headache in a patient who's never had headache before is always concerning. Uh, head CT. Just want to kind of put the plug in. This is the most overused test for headache. About 50% of head CTs done for headache are unnecessary. The usefulness of CTs of the head are limited, except in emergent circumstances. So those thunderclap headaches where patients are presenting to the ED, absolutely get your head CT. Outside of the emergency department, we really don't want to be getting CTs because their clinical utility is low. What they can rule out are, is it are problems with blood, either bleeding or clotting. So um, uh, epidur uh, SAH, epidural or subdural hematomas, intraparenchymal hemorrhages, these things are easily seen on CTs, other than that, or, or a skull fracture. Outside of that, it's really not going to pick other things up. MRI of the brain is the gold standard. So if you are going to put your patient in some kind of a scanner and you're not an ED provider, MRI of the brain is probably going to be your go-to. If you get an MRI of the brain, use contrast whenever possible. So I always want to do with and without contrast unless there's a contraindication to contrast this is going to pick up more abnormalities than your non-contrast MRIs. These can identify intracranial pressure problems, infections, and tumors. Angiography is often helpful. These are indicated when you are suspicious for cerebrovascular pathology. So you think there may be an aneurysm, a vessel dissection, something of this nature, or if it's one of those thunderclap headaches where you're an ED provider and you need to rule out, um, rule out that kind of a presentation, you want to get angiography. So MRA of the head and neck can be done. MRV is important to obtain, as we've talked about before. And CTA is often helpful in emergent circumstances. Um, or if you're MRA, if you start with MRA and um, it's not, you need you need more, um, you need to escalate kind of the evaluation. Sometimes the CTAs can show a little more vessel details. So um, sometimes you'll see an MRA and they'll, the, the report will say, um, you know, it's, it's, there's this abnormality, it might be okay, but it also could indicate this. Often they'll say, recommend CTA for further evaluation. Um, we're gonna go through, these are from, I apologize, those were a couple of slides that uh, were left over from a different presentation, but out of the scope of our talk today. Uh, hopefully I've been able to give you some good pearls to be able to rule out secondary headaches in your patients. This is just a kind of a list of resources that I got my information from in case you are looking for additional information. Thank you and I look, we look forward to seeing you at the next lecture from APP to APP virtual lectures.